embarrassing comments. No embarrassing comments, no. <laughs> so oh, it's, it's great to see you, Lauren. We're just, uh, I'm just waiting for this to kind of boot up now and, and get us into the into the space yeah. um, uh, on the, on the uh, oh, we're on there, so that's great. Uh, well, hi, hi, Laura, great to see you again. Hey, good to so be you've here. Got a, you've got the, um, the accolade or the dubious pleasure, depends how you want to see it, uh, <laughs> of being the first person to come back into the group for another chat. So, so welcome back. Thank you. And I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to be, you know, the inaugural speaker in this season, uh, because th that ho this whole series, since you've started Dog Centered Care of uh, Facebook Lives, has just been incredibly important and I, and I think to use a kind of current political phrase it's contributed to the democratization of dog training <laughs> that's a really important word isn't it and I think this whole yeah. this current movement if you want to call it that or the, or the what what's happening at the moment I think it is quite avant-garde I think it's I think it's very uh you know all voices have a place yes yeah and I know we we really wanted to focus on um, the process of collaboration and what that means and how it's influenced us and maybe some takeaways that um, other people can um, can use. So I don't know where you want to start with that. I mean, I will just say, I've done a lot of collaborating in my life because in my um, life before being a dog trainer, I was a an academic, a university professor. So I, I edited anthologies. I worked with groups of people, um, but none of them have been like the collaboration I've had with you, Andy because I am now uh, really thinking um, those were not really collaborations. Yes, they were collegial. <laughs> you know, we, we supported each other and it was an important um, part of our development. But I, I think to me, um, other than the fact, and I, I warned Andy, I was gonna say this, that I think we are identical twins that were separated at birth and we've now found each other late in life. Anyway, um, there, there are these kind of organic collaborations, relationships that happen. And, and um, we know that happens on the social side of our life. It's far more unusual for it to happen um, professionally, intellectually, that it also includes, you know, the fact that I, I really care about you. I, I think that that is, um, that is, for me, the bottom line of collaboration, as well as it being a process of on, ongoing learning from each other. I think that's important. Yeah, you know, I'd mirror everything back to you. I think I think what I what we want to try and talk about is two things really is why is that true collaboration not that common? Uh, and and also the, the real importance of it, especially with these new discussions. Well why did I think Laura I think to, to have a collaborative space that that kind of works there has to be that mutual respect and uh, and definitely an interest in each other's work. Yes, and and this is so important on so many levels. I, I I'm doing another thing. In fact, I'm recording it this this afternoon where I'm going to talk about relationship. <laughs> um, it, and and re good relationship is the same when we're collaborating, when we are collaborating, you and me, um, or if I'm in a relationship with my dog, right? Because it requires a good relationship. And what is a good relationship? 
It is um, a relationship where you are listening to learn, not listening, not waiting for the other person or your dog to talk, quote unquote, um, so that you can then jump in and give your answers. <laughs> and that's really important, isn't it? Because whether we're working in a, the kind of collaborative space that you and I have done, we, we're going to touch on a little bit later on about our previous project, re-envisioning reactivity, and then also a couple of new projects that are coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, but also when it's our relationship with our client, uh, and I say with the dog, if we've got a very fixed view, I talk a lot about that kind of task oriented head mm -hmm. where like, this is what we're going to do. And we're not available for that feedback. We're not creating a true collaborative space. And even with our clients, we do. I, I hear this word compliance used a lot. Uh, still, you know, this notion of getting compliance. So already we're losing what you've just said there, which is actually being available to, to hear something, which, which might change everything, right? You meet up that dog that day and that dog might be telling you something, which means that actually, do you know what, we're going to have to do something very different to what I, I, I planned or I, I envisaged for today. And I find myself doing that uh, many, many times in client sessions. Um, you know, Andy and I were talking just a little bit be, before we went live about this term compliance, and it is so often applied to humans as well as dogs, right? A compliant dog is not necessarily a relaxed, calm dog who can do social processing. <laughs> and actually make sense of the world around them. Um, clients have their own questions. You know, they have their own issues with the behavior. And I always have to have a, con a in-depth conversation with a client first before I commit to any program. I, I have frequently found that I just have to toss out what I've put together, <laughs> what, what I've thought from the written communication, because when I actually talk to the person and meet the dog, I, I want to do something very different. And if you went in with that um, uh, listening to answer <laughs> mindset, um, you, you would not be able to do that. And I think you would be much less effective as a dog professional, no matter what side of the profession you're on. Um, and it, it just doesn't make for good relationships. Yeah. And so do you think that maybe some of the barriers there are about, uh, Insecurity uh, that, you know, it's, it's easier to turn up with something that's already formed and ready uh, rather than allow yourself to be a bit more vulnerable. Because uh, when we think about collaborative spaces, especially the work that we've done, there is an element of being vulnerable there. It's, it's kind of turning up and, and uh, showing that interest in somebody else's opinions and their work and then being put in a position where you're allowing yourself to reappraise your own. Yeah. And I, I think you you put your finger on the heart of it, right? I, in, in, on many different levels. Um, collaboration, genuine collaboration, no matter what you're doing and where it's happening, requires slow thinking, right? It's deliberate. It's um, energy intensive. It uses a lot of the uh you know neural synaptic energy we have available it, it's not fast um and we have to always be willing to adjust uh to get feedback from from our collaborators and then say okay well you know maybe given what i'm hearing i'll I want to do something different. I'm going to change my position or, oh, I didn't know that. That gives me a whole different dimension for seeing what I'm doing. And, you know, let's just be honest. 
most of us don't like to do that. <laughs> you know, it's much easier if we have we have a framework, we have a blueprint, we can just go in, you do what I say, and I don't have to change my views. It, it's a lot easier, it's a lot faster. Um and in dog training, it might be more commercially viable. Um, I, I think some of it, especially for newer dog trainers, can come some of the reluctance to engage in genuine collaboration with a client, for example, might come from an unwillingness to be seen as not substantial or I don't, you know, I need to appear like I know what I'm doing. Uh, but I think that's usually a very um, mistaken view. What clients want is empathy. They want to be heard. They want to be seen. And they want you to really engage in a genuine um, exchange with them. And that's really important because it's something that I kind of uh, promote myself, this notion of being heard, because uh and i think we can all think back to when we first started and how we felt that pressure to kind of deliver something and um i definitely th can think back to my early time especially when things weren't going well i knew when things weren't going well in front of my eyes because i started talking more because <laughs> uh, i'm trying to desperately salvage something through my words and trying to yeah. make positives and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but you kind of do that less as you as you move on especially when you start front loading with really getting that client on side first with them feeling they can express themselves freely and, and you can really hear from them what it is that their their own care and support needs are as part of that process. I think it's I think it's really important. So when we think about collaboration then, something we were discussing uh, before we got together for our um, re-envisioning reactivity um, workshop, I suppose it really, uh, that we put on together, webinar workshop that we put together about how, how uh, uncommon it is actually for two professionals to come together in that truly collaborative space. Uh, and I think there's something about, obviously the technology we have now helps because it's a lot easier for sure. Uh, but also I think there's something about the spirit, we were talking about this a moment ago, this kind of uh, avant-garde movement that's going on that kind of promotes this, that actually, an individual trying to capture everything, to try and make everything part of their thing, is kind of not fit for purpose now, because what we're thinking about is trying to be more available to that emotional truth of another. Uh, and this happens to be another species, and it's gonna take multiple voices. And there's a richness, isn't there, when you both come together around a topic uh, and uh, when we did our event, it wasn't just a case of you did your bit and I did my bit. We had those big bits in between where we discussed each other's work and each other's um, outlook. Yeah, and of course, a lot of that had gone into it before in our many meetings where we showed each other what we were doing. And then I, I frequently found myself changing what I was doing in relation to what you were saying and what I, I saw from you. And I, I, I so want to echo your point here because um, let's face it in dog training. And I, uh, this is not really much different than the 30 years I spent as a university professor, right? You are basically working in isolation. Um, even if you're surrounded at a, you know, by people at a big dog training facility, chances are you're still working on your own. You, you have to produce, you know, your, your own classes, et, et, et cetera. And um, this is partly economic, but I think partly the some of the history of dog training, um, it, it's also pretty competitive. You know, you're competing for clients, you want to make a living. Um, can, can I collaborate with that person if they learn what I do? 
are they going to take my clients away? I mean, it's that kind of bread and butter stuff that um, that often makes collaboration difficult. And I, but I think, and then the second part um, that I I just want to underline, reinforce, say yes, is that no one framework has all the answers. I don't care who it is or what they're offering. They do not have all the answers. You, I remember saying I was an inaugural speaker at the first Aggression and Dogs conference. And one of my very first posters in my presentation was, in order to really uh, address this issue of aggressive behaviors, we have got to have multiple voices and multiple approaches. There is not one approach that is going to resolve everything. And I think this is writ large for this new transformational movement that we're seeing, which I just think is fabulous. It is opening up so many spaces for um, people to engage with each other in ways that wouldn't have been possible, certainly pre-pandemic. And I think that was your point, the technology and the acceptance of doing Zoom, online, live stream, whatever the framework is so much more now. But I, I do think people are also seeing that the previous one size fits all framework, maybe behaviorism, uh, not adequate to all the issues of uh, certainly the dogs in front of us or us as dogs, uh, dog professionals. So uh, we need more voices and we also need to do an ongoing audit. Because this is not, uh, we're just one big tent and everything is going to come in no matter what. No, there are some things that are going to drop out. One of them would be that word compliance. We, As far as I'm concerned, we can just delete that along with other words like willful, stubborn, um, lazy you know, those words that people often apply to dogs, but can be applied to clients too. Yeah, I love that notion of having an audit, you know, kind of checking in where we are and what what is useful moving forward and what is just kind of muddying the waters or, or mm -hmm. holding us back, you know? Uh, and I think that's something else. Um, the educational element for people has been quite two-dimensional, I think, until recently in the, maybe the last few years where, you know, you, if you'd have your primary initial source of education that might have been through university or it might have been through uh, diplomas or through certifications or whichever way you come through. And then you get certain keynote people all kind of saying similar things often, but in a different way. I think the educational side of things now is really exciting for people because they can look at individual aspects and actually get a lot from them. Whether it's somebody talking about the physiology, the neurology, the ethology, or whatever it is, you know, you, you talk a lot about the cognitive processing side of things. So there's a richness there now. Uh, and the more that we can get those who are providing those topics and points to come together in collaborative spaces like you and I are trying to do. And, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at working with, with other people like um, Dr. Holly Tet and, and Rachel Leather. We'll, we'll talk about those kind of in a moment. Uh, individual the individual listening whether you're a caregiver or a professional there will be strands there that will make sense for you and how you operate and how you want to connect with dogs and especially if your caregiver will uh resonate for you about the dog you have yes and i i couldn't agree more couldn't agree more and actually my um latest version of my slow thinking is life saving for dogs course just started today um and i was redoing my 
uh, my week one video introduction for the course. And I found myself saying, and this is something I've said very frequently um, in all the classes I teach, I am not going to give you a blueprint. I do not want you to take this and say, okay, here's A, here's B, here's this way of thinking. I'm going to do this not only with my own dogs, but every, you know, every dog I work with, because that is not going to be effective. And actually it goes against the grain, the ethics of what I want to, uh, of what I want you to take away from this course, right? Which is you need a base of knowledge. And from that, you draw to uh, address the issues of the dog in front of you, because every single one of them, as you love to say, their emotional truth is going to be different. Um, and we have to provide support, help for that dog, not just funnel them a blueprint. And that gets trickled down, doesn't it? Because we all need to work together in these collaborative spaces to try and think about more ways to be available to that truth, how we do those good observations, what those different aspects might be so that we can provide that relief for the dog and help that communication flow better. But that then it also gets passed on from the professional to their client. You know, how do, the, how do we work together to find out the best way to get those care and support needs for your dog. And I think as a client, as the professional, you also have to take some, uh, some role in recognizing the client's care and support needs as part of that process uh, and allowing an, orga an organic process to flow out really. I think that's, that's really important. Uh, so when we think then about um, something you said earlier about the, the kind of economics of some of this, I think that's a really important point because I know, uh, when we're looking at ourselves as a primary business, so I run mine and you, you run yours, you know, just seeing regular folk uh, and their dogs, uh, we have to raise an income. We have, to, we have to bring the pennies in, we have bills to pay. Uh, and I think uh, that's where it can be difficult to connect with those in the locality. And, and, and mm -hmm. if that wasn't enough, we have in part created this quite aggressively competitive model in our industry. Uh, which is fueled by various things. Uh, I won't go into those, but but um, uh, and I think uh, what I would say is, in my, I can only talk on my experience, but reaching out to local uh, colleagues, uh, created creating good spaces. I've mentored quite a few people locally, and I think uh, and I but I also understand why some people don't want to do that, and that can be just because um, for, you know, for for their own personal reasons or. If their local area, they feel that the, there is the, the competitive risk, and I think those those are very sound reasons. Yeah. But to do the mentoring, especially, I, I think one of the key things is some people get pressured into doing mentoring, and I think you have to start from a place of uh, kind of quite a settled confidence space mm -hmm. um, because the reality is, if somebody comes to you for some mentoring and you don't. It doesn't mean they're not necessarily going to come and work with dogs. They, they're still going to follow that dream and they'll probably get mentored by somebody else or they'll just get on with it by themselves. But you've lost that connection now, potentially. Uh, and uh, it depends on the local market, I know, but where I live, especially, there's definitely enough dogs to go around. We need more professionals more than anything else. Uh, but this thing about being in a space, I think we have to start recognising that a lot of what we talk about has to be open source, really. You know, we have our own uh, mechanics that we might want to, uh, you know, um, brand or, or connect to, which is fair enough. But the general information has to be open uh, so that others can take it and do what they need to do with it. And that includes when we're working with local professionals who, you know, if I work with a local professional and they might see how I work and they might go on and do it. Well, I'm going to presume that that's going to be the case. That's why they're there. Yeah. And that's hard. <laughs> what you... have <laughs> What you've just, I mean, and I, we probably don't need to open the whole Pandora's box of intellectual property and all that kind of 
stuff, but that that is certainly a piece of it, right? Um, you know, but I think there's a difference between that intellectual property, what I just wrote, and general knowledge, which is that dogs think, dogs feel, um, uh, aversive methods don't work. We have overwhelming science to back that up. So what, you know, A, that is a general knowledge that I would like everyone to have. And then if they gain some ideas about how to promote that reality, how to talk about partnership with our dogs instead of dominance or, um, you know, I just got an email this morning from someone, a potential client who says, well, I have a, I have a pit bull. He's very excitable. He's doing A, B, C, and D. And I need to be more assertive with him. So I need your help. I mean, I don't want to give her the bad news that I, you know, no, I'm not going to help you be more assertive. Quite the opposite. In fact, that is kind of the, the general mode that I want, desperately want everyone to learn. Um, yeah, so, I think there's a bigger issue there, isn't there? Sorry, I was just going to say, yeah, uh, because um, intellectual property is really important. And uh, uh, the, the way that we individually present things and the way that we you know, we spend a lot of time, don't we, thinking things through and trying to provide uh, something that people can easily access, which might be actually quite a complex principle. Mm -hmm. And we have our own ways of doing it. I think uh, what's important for me is a recognition that other people are going to take that stuff, even the stuff that we say, Laura, and things that we educate yeah. about. And they will make it their own and they, they will go through their own filters. The yes. problem, of course, is when people make it their own uh, from uh, the things that we've written or put out material wise and then somebody claims it as their own and I think one, we've just got to be better I think as a community at referencing and crediting each other yeah uh, it's because, called honesty <laughs> yeah we just need to do it and there's no harm in it right I, I credit all the time whether it's you or Sarah yeah. or Kim or Kathy whoever it is that I'm talking about at the time uh, and it's good right we, I think yes. again it comes down to this confidence thing when I see some things I read or some things I see and it's pretty clear that it's actually just taken from somewhere else but there's no credit for it I just see that as an insecurity in that individual uh maybe yeah um and I think honesty um generosity crediting people's work is one form of generosity right that we need to always um engage in. But I also think that true collaboration, however it occurs, um, and this speaks to the, the kind of situations we were just dis discussing, requires genuine humility, mm. right? Uh, be because if I think my program has all the answers, um, or that I can I can incorporate everything into my program. Wow, that that is what I would call a world historical view of dog training that um, not humble, not generous, doesn't open any space for collaborative work. If all I'm doing, that's another version of listening to answer. Because all I'm doing is taking what you're saying and subsuming it under my own rubric. Yeah. And that sadly has happened a lot. Yes, it has. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and this is where, uh, again, I think the, the, the virtual space that has really exploded because after the pandemic has helped shift some of that. I, I had a really lovely email. Somebody came to on my... Uh, unpacking the emotional experience course and, uh, and I focus more on the perceptions of behavior more generally so yeah I think people to think you know more freely and, and kind of get away from some of the chains of that kind of good to bad continuum and all the labels you were talking about earlier 
And uh, this, this lady had had a very structured education before. So she'd gone through uni, done a lot of structured things, but she's ended up doing your slow thinking course, legs. She's done a module on it with ACE. She'd done some of the, she did one of the Barks, uh, I think the Barks 101 with Sindor Pangal. Uh, and she said that she's learned way more by having these individual strands and creating that kind of richness, that that kind of portal into the dog's existence mm -hmm. than she did from all the academics, the, just the structured academic stuff. And I think that's really interesting because we have this chance now um, that people don't have to just do the one-stop shop thing. They can just do all these individual components that start to build up a picture that makes sense for them, is authentic for them within, with it, within their own outlook. Uh, and allows them to be more flexible then in how they approach working with the dog and clients. And I think along with humility, genuine collaboration requires exactly that kind of flexibility and knowledge base, multiple knowledge bases that you, you are describing. Uh, be, because um, there's no blueprints. <laughs> It's, you know, if you can just give someone a blueprint or um, address the behavior issues of a dog or even just start a puppy using a blueprint, um, it, it's, you don't really have to do a lot of thinking, right? You just, you do what I say. And if you don't, you're not compliant. <laughs> Um, and, these, and these rigid models, of course, aren't unique to just dog training. They're the same in human oh, psychology, no. charge education psychology. Or there's, there's also oh, yeah. where we've had the same very rigid models for certain things, which have all proven to fall flat. They yeah. might work in some areas and they might even get the goal you want, especially if you're looking for compliance, right? Yeah. Um, but might not necessarily bear witness to the emotional need of the person. That we, they've just got them to do something different. Yeah. I mean, I just have to say, I, um, and again, I speak as someone who's done a lot, a huge amount of group work in my previous career as an academic, you know, working in focus groups, academic groups, editing anthologies, co-writing things, but as we talked briefly about before a co it's interesting there are more co-written books now in the dog training world that can be a collaborative exercise but it is not necessarily because what often happens and i'm speaking from experience here is i write my stuff you write your stuff you know, we combine it together as chapters and then it's published. Is that collaborative? No, not really. It's collegial. You know, we're friends. Uh, we get along. Uh, I've read your chapters. I don't have any major issues with them. Uh, but, but in my view, collaborative work is the, like the work we did in the revisioning reactivity um so let's let's focus on that then because um one of the things that we really did to start that process off was not coming to the table with anything set it was a case of what questions do we need to ask about yeah. the perceived wisdoms around the reactive dog i do that because I, I yeah, we did, I talked about yeah. That. what what do we what do we need to think about again what do we need to look at and we swore at the beginning of that process that we would not necessarily be looking to find all those answers we were not mining answers we were posing questions yeah and i think that's really true i mean in my whole history of writing which includes my all my academic work and and i'll, I'll just be honest here uh, most of the time, my most effective writing, I started with something that just pissed me off. <laughs> yeah. That was my primary, you know, oh, I, I just hate this. I've got to, you know, work through it. And um, that didn't happen with, <laughs> I don't want to say that happened with, with us because I remember 
you sent me an email and just said, okay, um, you know, I've been thinking about reactivity uh, lately and, um, and some issues I have with the current, you know, way it's being talked about and, and programs, you want to think more about it. That's how it started. Just kind of this invitation to, yeah, let, let's, let's think about it and then focus on the questions. What questions do we have? And then of course, for me, it was like, what pisses me off most greatly about current discourse about reactivity in dogs. Um, and, and from there, we, we were able to generate what I think is really a transformational um, product, which is the, which is the webinar. The webinar is a thing on its own. I'm much more interested in the process we we use to work up to that because I do think I I I can really say these um the producing the webinar our work together has been the most genuinely collaborational experience that I've had and I've done a lot of group work in a lot of different settings and and what set it off besides the fact that we're identical twins separated at birth um it is uh the the kind of mutual learning right the generosity the humility but the openness to um okay i hear you and you know what that that changes how i think and that was the but that was a really key part of it, wasn't it? Because um, I probably, because you can't not have some preformed views because that's how the brain yeah. works. Right? Yeah. Because otherwise it will just be jelly. Uh, but um, uh, I shifted many of my outlooks in those initial planning sessions we had together. So I think uh, you definitely helped my bit uh, get better. Uh, and uh, and definitely there were bits of the jigsaw from my analog where I was thinking, well, yeah, that bit doesn't fit for me anymore. What would replace it? And I'm not sure I might have a bit of it, but your bit gave me that extra bit. And, they, and I think part of that process was how finger in glove it was really, because um, uh, when we actually, what we decided to do in the end was we'd got probably 50% of each other's work done. Yeah. And then yeah. we said, right, we're just going to turn up now on the day and let it be a really organic. So there was parts of your presentation that I hadn't seen fully mm -hmm. because I think you sent me a message the day before saying, I've, I've changed a lot again. I've changed <laughs> a lot again. So, um, and it was the same with mine. And I think that was what made it very amazing for the people who were there live at the event because I was just so blown away by aspects of your, of your presentation because there was bits of it that I, I hadn't seen before. Right? And it was really, so when we had that chat and we had those chats at the beginning, uh, then I did my bit in between, and then you did your bit, and then that bit at the end. Uh, it added again a richness to that because it was very there was a spontaneity to it. Well, I I think, and of course that that's the way it functioned for me too. <laughs> that that was very much my experience, and that's that mutual give and take, being open to learning. Um, you know, at some point you just have to say enough. <laughs> No, no more changes, but um, but I think up to the final moment, <clears throat> we were engaged in that in that mutual learning process, and I think both both of us really benefited from that. I know I did, um, and, and I and yet. People who watch the webinar are getting, if, you know, for each individual presentation, they're getting very different views, right? You you came at it from um, your the emotional truth, what is behavior, um, and I I came at it from a more 
um, you know, what, what, what is the, what are the kind of mechanisms that work here, the distortions? Why is this behavior so difficult to resolve? Uh, and then given that, what can we do about it? <laughs> Um, and how does the current rhetoric of reactivity not help with that at all? Um, and so people were getting very different material <laughs> and points of view from us. But I think you're right. It was in those um, in-between sections where we processed what I heard from you, what you heard from me. Um, and then, and then even then <laughs> come to a new understanding. And that was important because I think uh, it was the continuation, especially when we had the, um, the opportunity, we set up a, a closed Facebook group for those people who attended for the, for the original. And we were able to continue that conversation a little bit because uh, especially for people who came, but even for you and I, I went away thinking, oh, hang on, I need to digest some of this now and, and think about some of these different bits. And, and this for me is the power of this collaborative um, space that we have that. And uh, so uh, I can see a couple of people in the group just asking about links to the webinar. I'll make sure we do that because you can actually see it as a standalone uh, piece now. It's on a kind of teachable format. Which will be there. We, we can, uh, and I'll make yeah. sure we share that after today. Yeah. Um, but uh, we're we're looking at kind of expanding on this now because we had such fun, and we thought, well, you know, why do something as simple as just rethinking <laughs> reactivity, and you know, why why just do the easy stuff, right? So we're going to be doing a couple of other projects actually. So um, one is with uh, with Dr. Dr. Holly Tet. Uh, we're going to be looking at. Um, uh, it's quite a big scope really there, isn't it, for, for that one, looking at um, uh, the, the whole dog, <laughs> the whole dog. Yeah. And the relationships between a lot of these different factors uh, there. But we'll, we'll we'll just do a little tease on that. But uh, it was very much early in the in the kind of um, development there. But that'll be coming out uh, at some point not in the not too distant future. But the next big one for you and I, we've, we've kind of thought about reactivity and, and thought about some of those questions. We want to turn on to aggression now which in, in, a, in a more wider term uh, and there's a lot for us to unpack there and we want to definitely we want to be focusing in we will be focusing in on the, the aspect of trauma as part of that mm -hmm. like class is an aggressive response and we've got the amazing Rachel Lever coming in with us on that so Rachel obviously has her expertise in trauma uh, mm -hmm. and I think this is going to be another big one Laura and, it, and, and I think you have to have a safe collaborative space to even think about tackling these things because yeah. um, you know there are there are parts of our community that don't like to have to rethink stuff uh, or uh, you know look at it again. Well, so, and uh, and and let's just be honest. I don't particularly like doing that either. <laughs> you know, on my day because you know it, it comes back to the slow and fast thing. Yeah, I mean revaluing, reframing, rethinking, you know, it's what makes life meaningful, but we also need that fast thinking lubrication, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to have to rethink everything. So I, I, I totally get resistance. I, I can only plea with people who are feeling resistant you might be surprised at how um, invigorating, how exciting um, this opens up, uh, you know, many, many new areas, new vistas for us. And, that, and that's what keeps life meaningful, right? <laughs> yeah, and I think we have kind of, without meaning to, put ourselves in a bit of a cul-de-sac within the dog training world um, without realizing there's a, there's a way in and a way out behind us uh, and there's a bigger space to explore. And, uh, and also this kind of, I, I saw a piece recently and um, uh, I thought it was a really good piece. And there was a couple of words in that piece that made me think, mm, I probably wouldn't have phrased it like that, but I got the spirit of the piece. Mm -hmm. And yet in the comment section, there were so many people picking up on those couple of words 
And we've got to move on from that a little bit because we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater here by, by thinking, OK, I've seen something for an hour. I really enjoyed kind of, you know, 50 minutes of it, hmm. but 10 minutes of it I don't agree with. So therefore, I'm going to dismiss the other 50 minutes of it. Yeah. Um, and that's what we've tried to put across with with our uh, first kind of collaborative piece. And we will definitely be with the trauma and aggression one is asking lots of really important questions that we, again, we might not have the answers to. And just posing some thoughts of is this model or are some of these models that we've had, are they fit for purpose, really, when we start thinking in the way that we're thinking now? Mm. It's OK making these shifts and we are having them for sure you know uh, but what does that mean then when we reevaluate, when we look back on some of those perceived wisdoms now some of those aspects will fit nicely but mm -hmm. others won't and if mm -hmm. we don't ask the questions we were just going to try and fit the the kind of round peg of this new stuff into that old square sorry the square peg into that old round hole and mm -hmm. we're going to miss so much stuff yeah i agree I, I agree. I think it's never too late to learn. <laughs> I say this all the time to clients who think their dog's life is over at six months. Um, no, and it's true for us too. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been learning my whole life and my mantra is, you know, uh, continue learning um and it and it and it is that it's not just the emotional space of collaboration that makes it so rewarding um it it is the new learning that we can do right because if i were trying to do this you're you're absolutely right andy if i were trying to do this all on my own in my little isolated space in ithaca new york where, you know, yes, I have a lot of clients, but you, my life is pretty circumscribed here. <laughs> I'm on my own. I, it would be much more difficult than, uh, for example, me having you to, you know, get feedback, talk to moral support, emotional support. And then, you know, in terms of our upcoming trauma, um, collaboration you know with rachel that it's not adding in rachel because rachel's gonna actually change probably what we do 100 percent, yeah exactly and that's what i'm really excited about the development meetings we're going to have uh about what this is going to look like because it's going to be very different from day one isn't it yes yeah yeah um so I hope people have learned, you know, or at least become inspired. Maybe that would be the way to talk about it. Um, be brave. Uh, collaborate. That, that's my new mantra, right? Be brave. Collaborate. Um, but I, I think it, it takes that. And I, I really hope that people will now want to try it in whatever way makes sense to them. Yeah, and even, uh, you know, um, one of the main reasons that I set up Dogs Into Care as a group was to create a space for collaboration, really. Uh, even things as simple as sharing other people's stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you see something in, and you like it, then like it, but share it as well, because, the, you know, we've got to just keep getting stuff out there and being prepared to share each other's work and and championing each other and supporting each other as part of a, a more wider thing and uh, there are those competitive needs that we talked about earlier but we don't have to subscribe to an overly aggressive competitive model we, we can right. not to right i mean i want to make a living so do you but that doesn't mean um enclosing ourselves <laughs> in the, you know, in this bricked in tower where we don't share anything and, and we're not really learning, you know, new, um, new ways of thinking, new ways of being emotionally, um, new ways of learning how to ask, you know, your just bottom line question in my mind, and that is, um, what do I need to learn from 
this other, whether that's a dog, a human, my African gray parrot, I mean, wh whatever the, whoever the other is, um, and how, how can I become available to their emotional truth? Yeah, and I think that's the, ultimately, that is the key, isn't it? That, that's the point. The whole point is we're trying to be better at being available to the emotional truth of dogs. That's what we're all trying to do, really. It's, it's about the dog, ultimately. Yes. Uh, I mean, my friend Sally Lewis, who's a great behaviorist locally and uh, very upcoming, really, um, with a lot of the work she does. We're, we're meeting on Tuesday and we're going to have cake of course, and, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. but we're also going to be looking about what can we do together in person stuff, you know, right. and that kind of thing. So it's always worth reaching out and making those spaces. I think that's a great spot for us to kind of um, think about uh, kind of finishing up on then, Laura, um, yeah. because uh, that is the spirit of why, why we wanted to do this chat today, really, was just to talk about collaboration and the importance of it. And, and uh, not to be fearful of it, I think that that's something that is very important. And it, and it you've got to feel safe within that collaboration that's very that's very important and i think finding a good fit like we have been yeah mm -hmm. uh, it can really make things happen in a great way then you know yeah um but uh, what else are you up to then laura before we finish off what else have you uh, what are you doing at the moment or anything you want to share with us well i um i've got my class going which i've reconfigured because i'm now incorporating a a lot of elements on slow thinking and the recovery, uh, slow thinking and trauma, slow thinking and as recovery from trauma um, into it. And I, I probably will do some, some standalone on that at some point. Um, but actually mo most of what I'm doing now is, um, looking forward to our event with Holly Tat um, coming up at the end of May and then whatever we're going to do on aggression and trauma um, this summer, sometime this summer. Yeah, exciting times, isn't it? And I'm really excited about that myself as well. And um, uh, well, thank you, Laura, as always. And if anybody hasn't... Um, those who are interested in your slow thinking is life saving. I'll post the link. There's post the links on there. Yeah. Also, the re envisioning reactivity and I'll post how long it's taken. Yeah. Even yeah. Say that word. It's taken a long time. <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't even say that word at the at the work at the webinar. I I, I, I practiced it. So, <laughs> so. Uh, just let people know. Just uh, you very kindly said at the beginning about how these kind of chats have, have become quite important, and I get a lot of. A lot of stuff in my mailbox from people who really love the catching up on the chats and I've tried to curate it in such a way that we have different aspects and different voices and we've definitely got this in this season so just to give people a bit of a, a taste we've got Rachel uh, Rachel Jackson coming up uh, talking about touch and physiology and a lot of things there. Um, Denise and Moore and June Panel are coming as a to, to talk about collaborative spaces they're coming together uh, focusing in on bereavement uh, which is uh, really fabulous. Really Sadly, I, I've had a lot of friends who have who have uh, lost their their dogs in in the last since I have a bit of a period at the moment. Um, we've got Mandy Wilson coming as well, looking at some of the child educational models, uh, the importance of working with individuals. Uh, Maya Rose is going to come in uh, very much on trauma, but also looking at safeguarding, safeguarding for us as professionals, mm -hmm. and looking at the connection between animal abuse and uh, domestic abuse. Uh, Lauren McCall, uh, well known in teacher circles, of course, but Lauren's going to be talking about something that might be a little bit left field for some people, but I think it just adds to the richness, richness of the group. And I think uh, having met Lauren, Lauren now lives about 10 minutes away from me, which is amazing. So I get to see her. <laughs> and her work. Lauren's going to be talking about animal communication and what she's learned from her work there on a very spiritual level. Janet Finley talking about both ends of the leash. Uh, and if that wasn't enough, and also Sandy Sharma. Sandy Sharma's coming in next week. Uh, I love Sandy so much. Um, and Sandy's going to be sharing with us her heartfelt, heart-connected kind of model and also looking at uh, the need for more awareness of inclusivity and diversity within the industry. Uh, and then if that wasn't enough, Laura, right? All these wonderful things come up. And, and others, by the way. I, I, it's, it's not... Uh, it's not 
the full list is just who are coming up in, in coming up. We've also on the 7th of June starting off with Robert Faulkner Taylor's monthly talk. So Robert um, went down a storm when he came into Dog CC, but he's got uh, somebody booked in every month between now and Christmas. And I'll wow. Share the whole, the whole um, I'll share the whole schedule. And Rob will really be looking at these things. Robert will be looking at these things from a very academic lens, uh, but doing it in a very accessible way, which, which he does very well, of course. Uh, so that's great. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Laura. And thank you, everybody, for listening in. Um, uh, I will start to get some of the events put up. Uh, and I might actually just do a bit of a poster with all the dates on ahead of time, actually. Um, yeah. So people can plan. I, um, and that's really good. And thank you, everybody, for supporting the group, as always. And remember, look for those collaborative spaces because they're exciting and they're really they really pay dividends and um, uh, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. And thank you again, Laura. Be brave. Collaborate. We've got to start getting a T-shirt ready for them, Laura. We've got loads of stuff that we can get on these things. But uh, yeah, be brave collaborate. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Laura. Bye.